This is a University of Otago podcast. Nga mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Nga o te rauro, nga ku te rauro ka ora ai te iwi. Ena mana, ena ria, a rarangitika ma, ma tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora everyone and welcome to this celebration of uh, Etienne Nell's inaugural professorial lecture. My name is Richard Blakey. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at the University of Otago. It's my pleasure to do the introductions tonight. I speak on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor who is here to, to be with us but has just returned from very long and exhaustive travel so um, was not 100% sure of, of whether that travel would bring her here and also that travel has meant that um, it's much better that I, I say some words tonight to allow her to rest and enjoy the evening. Uh, welcome colleagues, welcome visitors, uh, welcome members of the Dunedin community and special welcome to Etienne's wife Teresa and son Matthew who are here tonight uh, and to others who might be looking in from afar uh, who may be listening or looking into this live or via a podcast. Um, we have a tradition at this university that is the inaugural professorial lecture and it's a celebration of all that it means to be a professor here at the university. From our founding four professors of Scott and Shand and Black and Sale, we have set high standards for being a professor here, whether appointed by a far, from afar or grown from within. Those standards are sustained excellence and leadership in two of our core activities of teaching, research and service, and mere sustained excellence in the third. One cannot comp compromise excellence in any of these three pillars of our professional and professorial practice in order to gain this highest of status. And when these standards are met, it is well worth putting on the writs, getting out the regalia, and calling our leaders together and celebrating, which is why we are here tonight and why we will retire with you for re re refreshments and fellowship at the staff club at the end of these proceedings. Um, but actually, it's also a selfish, selfish exercise for us as academic leaders uh, to at one point in our week or our day, uh, forget about everything else for an hour and hear about the wonderful work and achievements of some of the finest minds uh, in this university. Um, it's an academic spa time for us, if you like. Tonight we have Professor Etienne Nell from the Department of Geography with his talk entitled Dealing with Difference, uh, Responses to Uneven Geographical Development. And it will be uh, the pleasurable duty of his Head of Department, Professor Sean Fitzsimons, to speak to you next to tell you a little bit about Professor Nell and his topic. But I may indulge with a few remarks first and a message from afar. Firstly, in September 2015, the United Nations adopted 17 sustainable development goals to transform our world, end poverty, protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all. I'm sure that when we hear from Professor Nell tonight, we'll, we'll hear of things that will be relevant or topical to many of these goals, and we should reflect that it is only through a lifetime of engagement and achievement through research leaders like him that we can even start to move towards putting reality towards some of these truly, truly difficult and aspirational goals. Secondly, we have confidence in Etienne and others in helping us to contribute strongly to these and other goals. Um, it is not only our opinion, but those of the referees who provide an independent international opinion on his promotion application, who speak to his abilities. And I quote, he has written much on economic geography, regional development, resource management, and historical geography. His more global frame of reference is one reason why he has been invited to speak at gatherings of scholars, as scholars and policy makers in a number of countries, and why he is consistently in, engaged in collaborative research, including with botanists and entomologists, as if there's some, something to be surprised about. He is conscientious, understanding, tolerant, broad-minded and insightful, and in, in reference to his excellence as a teacher, his evaluations at the end of a course were some of the best I have ever seen. And it is these kind of attributes that has led him to this promotion. Finally, a personal message from Etienne's nephew, Adrian, who is not able to be here tonight, but completed his PhD at Otago. He says, I would like to pass on the congratulations from my father, uh, Dion, Etienne's brother, my mother, Eileen, who are very proud of his achievements. As for myself, I would like to acknowledge that while I avoided geography in my undergraduate studies at Rhodes University, as Etienne was the head of department, both the subject 
and his influence in it were inescapable in the long run. In large part due to his influence, as well as that of Dr. Linda Mallam and my most able supervisor, Doug Hill, I completed and thoroughly enjoyed my own PhD studies at Otago. Now in my position as a lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal back in South Africa, his name and voluminous work is always forefront amongst those references our students engage in their work, which is a source of no small pride for me. My admiration and congratulations to him. So with those congratulations, my congratulations too to you, Etienne, and the great team you have beside and behind you. And I now ask Professor Sean Fitzsimons to formally introduce you and your topic to our audience tonight. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato katoa. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to um, uh, welcome you here again tonight. Um, welcome Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor Humanities. Welcome Etienne. Um, uh, welcome colleagues and family and friends. Um, it's a, a pleasure to introduce Etienne as I say. Etienne hails originally from Zambia where he was born in uh, 1962. His uh, schooling uh, was also in Southern Africa, in Zimbabwe. And then he studied um, at university in South Africa, and it was from Rhodes University that he graduated with his PhD in 1996. Um, Etienne came to us at the University of Otago in uh, 2008, um, and um, he joined a, a fairly vibrant Department of Geography, and he's become a leader in the uh, Human Geography program that teaches the BA at undergraduate level. So he's become a leader in, within the Department of Geography and within the university. He's uh, um, chaired uh, or, or been active at an international level. He's chaired the International Geographical Union Commission on Marginalisation for over eight years. Uh, and he's currently on the steering committee for the International Social Science uh, Council um, in the area of uh, poverty research. He's managing editor of our own um, local journal, the New Zealand Geographer, and he's commissioning editor for Australasia for the journal's Local Economy and the Journal of Geography and Higher Education. Um, Etienne is a fellow of the uh, Royal Geographical Society, and uh, next month, or is it later this month, next month, he will be awarded uh, a, a life fellowship from the South African Geographical Society. Um, over his career, Etienne has uh, edited or authored eight books, five conference proceedings, 43 chapters, and 115 periodical articles. It's uh, a real substance, substantial piece of work um, that he's done over his career. So it's great, with a great pleasure that I call Etienne um, to give his talk today, this afternoon, on dealing with difference, responses to uneven geographical development. Thank you, Etienne. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much for those kind words, uh, DVC Richard uh, Blakely and, and Head of Department Sean Fitzsimons. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Thank you that you can all be here this evening. I would like to start with a greeting, and my greeting is going to be in English. I was, took counselling for this and was suggested this would be the more appropriate way, given my background, to present it. My ancestral roots lie in Europe, and more especially in France when my ancestors fled from as religious refugees 12 generations ago, one of them becoming the first teacher in South Africa. My geographical bond is with Central and Southern Africa, with rivers such as the Zambezi and the dramatic mountains of the Cape being particularly significant to me. I value the welcome I have received in this my new home and its culture, and I would like to express my gratitude for being able to share this place with my Tahu and to have the pleasure of learning and sharing in the identities of the special location I now call home. I recently married Teresa, a New Zealander, and my daughters Catherine and Amy have both married New Zealanders. My son Matthew, who is 11, has settled well into his new country. So with a formal start, thank you very much 
Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, and friends and colleagues and students, thank you for being here this evening. My presentation this evening will explore the concept of uneven geographical development, a concept which has influenced my research and which has been informed by living in four very different countries. The concept of uneven geographical development is evident in the physical landscape and in the social and economic ones which overlay it. This occurs around the world. For example, right here in New Zealand, the rapid growth of Auckland, shown in this slide, contrasts with the modest economic and demographic performance in many other regions. Throughout the world, significant academic, applied and policy effort has gone into attempting to understand and respond to socioeconomic difference across geographic space. In New Zealand, state intervention to address this imbalance is not as significant as it used to be. This is in contrast to many other parts of the world where there are different ideologies respecting geographical and economic space. This is either because of the traditional pursuit of more interventionist ideologies and the response of states to structural imbalances in their economies, as in the case of the European Union. In other countries, the emergence of what is termed post-neoliberalism is noted, which relates to the notion that the state can be an active participant in the broader economy, for example, through the application of the concept of the developmental state in parts of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Geographical unevenness can be seen at various levels, such as between countries, within countries, and within local places, and is expressed in terms of differential ac access to wealth, socioeconomic opportunities, and the basic means of livelihood. We are growing increasingly conscious that differences are growing within and between countries. Locally here in New Zealand, there has been significant recent media attention paid to the challenges of child poverty, educational difference, and the growing housing shortage, which have felt most acutely in both the growing, but also the more deprived suburbs and towns. In my address this evening, I will firstly provide a short overview of my own life experience of living with uneven geographical development before moving on to look at some key theoretical principles which underlie and inform this concept. This in turn lays a basis for overviewing some of the research which I've undertaken, leading finally to the conclusion which considers the implications of my work. In terms of my personal background, I was born in what is now Zambia, then it was known as Northern Rhodesia, at the very end of the colonial period, into a middle-class family of a railway administrator and a primary school teacher. From an early age, I was exposed to the socio-economic differences which have made Africa the world's most marginalized continent. The region in which I spent my early years was on the border of the conflict-ridden Democratic Republic of the Congo, which at the time was being torn apart by a brutal civil war linked to the playing out of what in the West was euphemistically called the Cold War. But in places such as Africa, where this tension was played out, it resulted in a very dynamic and often brutal hot war scenario in which hundreds of thousands of people died. My father spoke frequent, frequently of seeing thousands of refugees crowding the platform of Ndola Station, shown in the slide on the bottom right, after fleeing the, Cong the conflict in Congo, which was just 10 kilometers away from where we lived. These initial years were spent in the Zambian Copper Belt, a zone of significant mineral wealth and growth, which existed in stark contrast with the impoverished subsistence economy of the rest of the country. Following independence, there was a change from colonial rule and control by foreign corporations into attempts at African socialism and nationalization, leading sadly to the near collapse of the mining industry and impoverishment of the country. My schooling was undertaken in what is now Zimbabwe during the Civil War of the 1970s. From an early age, I was exposed to living in a militarized context in which the injury or death of people I knew was not uncommon. As the years went by, we lived in an increasingly sheltered context, only leaving built-up areas and military convoys. During this time, however, my father shared his own concerns about the unfairness of enforced racial difference and his own misgivings about what had recently happened with, the South, with South Africa's transition to the apartheid state, which influenced my own awareness and understanding. My university training and subsequent employment were in South Africa, where the starkness of racial discrimination 
and enforced difference was far more evident and brutal than anything I had seen before. During my time as an undergraduate, riots on an orphan campus, the actions of the riot police, and, and the use of tear gas were common. Many of us regularly had our mail searched, phones tapped, and friends of mine were detained, and we had to contend with police spies amongst the student body. By the second half of the 1980s, when I started working, first as a school teacher and then as a university lecturer, the imposition of the state of emergency in the country and the heightened military control restricted research opportunities. And for a period, this meant that much of my early research was archivally focused, documenting how the state had replanned the country on racial lines since the 1940s. My first university post was one in, in one of South Africa's so-called homelands, notionally independent states which the government created for each tribal grouping to foster the illusion of difference and independence. Whilst being an instructive learning environment which exposed me to the realities of poverty and geographical unevenness, it had risks associated with living in an isolated rural town shown here, such as when the campus, not dissimilar from the buildings shown in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, where I worked was closed because of armed insurgents. When the police station and the prison, one block away from where we lived, was attacked by machine gun and rocket fire. By the early 1990s, the situation had changed and new research and applied opportunities opened up in my areas of interest related to economic development and how to bring about socio-economic redress in the South African context. Prior to the 1994 elections, which brought apartheid to an end and Mandela to power, I became involved with politically aligned think tanks uh, which were trying to chart a course for a post-apartheid economy. I also worked with the National Civics Organization to draft their national local economic development strategy. The period after the 1994 elections was a fruitful and stimulating time, which involved close interaction with government, as a result of which I helped to draft various development policies and worked with a range of international organizations in the design of strategy and policy, including the World Bank and the EU. The focus on marginalization and poverty continues into the present through my engagement with research in Southern Africa. During this time, I was married and raised three children. In 2008, we moved to New Zealand, where I took up my current post at the University of Otago. All three children now live in New Zealand, but sadly, my first wife, Nolene, unfortunately passed away soon after the move. Moving from a country in which an overtly developmental state is committed to addressing inequality and poverty to one in, in which much is left to market forces has been a stark contrast. This has since provided me with a rich opportunity to appreciate and work in two very different political and economic contexts, uh, material which I'll return to in the third part of my address. I will now move on to look at some theoretical principles underlying my work. As you are well aware, socioeconomic differences exist and appear to be growing in terms of a range of key variables. These can be shown through illustrations such as this cartogram in which the countries of the world are scaled according to the per person size of their economies. What we see in this is the extreme <coughs> distortion on the map in the Northern Hemisphere and the near disappearance of parts of South America and Africa, which at one level is symbolic of the nature of this difference. Within societies, inequality has been exacerbated for example, this growth, which comes from the United States, shows the growing wealth disparities within American society. What we see with the upper line is that since 1980, the wealth of the top 1% of the population grew by 201%, whilst the other population groups, other societal groups, had far more modest increments. These trends are also mirrored in New Zealand. The top 10% of the population in terms of earning controls 53% of the nation's wealth. This places New Zealand between the UK, where it is lower at 45%, and the US, where it is higher at 71%. The poorest 50% of New, Zealand, New Zealanders control just 4% of the nation's wealth. Globally, these differences are growing too. This table shows the wealth disparities between the developed and the developing world over time. As you can see, back in 1820, the disparity between the wealthy countries and the poor countries was three to one. There has been no narrowing over time, only a significant and radical growth in that difference and 
growing disparity. These realities raise the question of whether we should passively accept these outcomes as the inevitable consequence of adherence to the free market, or whether there is space for society and the state to work together in addressing structural and spatial imbalances. Such questions take us to the heart of economic theory and raise very real questions about social justice. We'll now look at some theory. Oh, sorry. That's better. <laughs> Firstly, classic economic theory, most especially the work of David Ricardo on the left-hand side, who argued in favor of the concept of the self-writing economy and argued also that non-intervention should take place across geographic space. However, a series of depressions in the 1800s and the Great Depression of the 1930s temporarily dispelled belief in this concept. After the Great Depression, state-led efforts to address socioeconomic and spatial differences were the norm for nearly 50 years and were based on the theories of Keynes shown on the right-hand side. Here in New Zealand, public work schemes such as job creation associated with the Waitaki Dam projects, the growth of the welfare state and trade protection for industry mimicked for, what, for a period what was the globally accepted norm regarding the role of the state in the economy. Despite evident improvement in improvements in welfare and education levels, however, there was little evidence in New Zealand or further afield of significant reversal of economic disparities across geographic space. This is supported by the theories of Miroslav Jovanovic, who showed that regional divergence, not convergence, is the norm. This is reinforced by the writings of Doreen Massey, who indicated the degree to which inherited social and economic factors perpetuate difference. In a similar vein, David Harvey argues that capitalism does not reduce regional difference, but rather perpetuates and exploits it to further its own ends. By the 1980s, the Keynesian state had been replaced by monetarism and neoliberalism, based on the theories of Hayek and Friedman, and anchored in the philosophy of reducing state expenditure and assuming market forces will address socioeconomic challenges. This approach, which has become all-pervasive in the Western world, argues that economic differences will disappear over time as growth, and the word they use is trickles down from the core areas to the periphery. Indeed, while there is clear proof of growth in some countries, such as South Korea, shown on the left, unfortunately this fails to occur in other parts of the world, whether it's been factory closures in Africa as a result of WTO regulations or the growing housing crisis and child poverty in New Zealand, there's little evidence that differences are diminishing. This reality has encouraged economists such as Joseph Stiglitz and Thomas Piketty and also prompted many countries in the South to reconsider the role of the state within society and to re-engage with concepts such as the developmental state, which is seen by some as a logical way to respond to market failures. Persistent geographic differences have long held the attention of economic geographers, spatial scientists, and economists. Much of this analysis is focused on the concept of the region. While significant research attention is also focused on the places and localities within such regions, this is particularly significant in terms of understanding geographic difference because of the degree to which According to the late Doreen Massey, the socioeconomic processes operating within these smaller centers create, reinforce, and perpetuate socioeconomic difference. Discourses on, the region, on regions and localities have led to an appreciation of what many term locked-in or path dependency, because such regions have social, employment, economic, and resource history, which often discourages innovation and change. This is particularly true of many Rust Belt areas shown here in the middle bottom slide in North America and Europe, which now have intergenerational unemployment, retarded development, and suffer from population loss, a lack of creative responses, and marginalization. By contrast, other regions have been able to, and the term is, break out and identify new opportunities, such as Sun Belt regions in the south of the USA, shown in the bottom right hand side. The result, according to Michael Chisholm, is the parallel existence of regions of recession and resurgence. This naturally raises challenging questions as the degree to which all or only a few regions or localities can change their historical trajectory, either through local or external action. 
For neo-Marxists, change will occur as capitalism evolve, evolves and selective re reuse space, while neoliberals neo rely on market forces to address differences. For writers on the role of agency, entrepreneurship and institutionalism, path dependency can be addressed through local and external action. Evolutionary economic geographers such as Martin and Kogler argue for a similar outcome. Joseph Schumpeter spoke of creative destruction, whereby following an economic shock, places can reinvent themselves. However, as more recent application of resilience theory and evolutionary economics shows, not all places can fully reinvent themselves after experiencing an economic crisis. The reality of uneven geographical development that I have observed has been distilled into my interest in the mapping of demographics and the concept of shrinking cities and towns, which I'll now draw on as a selective example of things I'm interested in. Shrinking towns or cities or places, often in old industrial regions, are those which experience absolute population loss, closure and dereliction, and occasional reinvention. While the collapse of Detroit is well known and is an extreme example of a place which has lost 50% of its population and much of its built environment, it is not alone. One in three German cities is declining. One in 10 in the US. 40, <coughs> excuse me, 14 of the 21 largest centers in the UK outside of London are static or declining. Some 370 cities globally with more than 100,000 people have lost 10% of their population. China, which is interesting to watch, its urban population will peak in probably 2050 and then decline. And Japan's population is already falling. Closer to home, 140 out of Australia's 299 centres with more than 10,000 people have experienced some degree of population loss at some stage since 1960. The following slides illustrate the scenario. This first map comes from the USA. It illustrates 43,000 places. A red dot is a growing town or city, a blue dot is a shrinking one. And one can just see how widespread the phenomenon of population loss is, with pictures such as those taken from Detroit, showing physical abandonment of factory but residential space being symptomatic of some of the changes many of the uh, more unfortunate areas of the world are having to deal with. But it also happens in Europe. Using red and blue again, Red shows urban growth, blue shows decline. The picture on the right is the destruction of apartments in Poland, where many towns have simply lost the reason for their existence. But it's not just North America and, and Europe. Map on the top left-hand side shows the situation as being a worldwide phenomenon. The map in the middle shows Germany. The, the shaded red areas are areas of significant loss in the old East Germany, as well as the Ru in the, the West. And the map on the top right, it's not a, an ideal map, but it shows the situation in China, the shaded areas of the municipal areas which are losing population. The same is happening in New Zealand as well. Maybe not as extensive, but as this graph shows, while some places grow, other places shown in red are declining as well, with towns such as Ojai and Nightcaps, uh, unfortunately ha having experienced significant structural and economic change in recent years. In response to this apparent local and regional crisis, many authorities in declining and static places still have a growth-focused response, arguing that they somehow will attract in thousands of new residents to their declining towns and cities. However, an interesting approach has been taken by many German and a few American cities, which argue that the era of growth has passed, and the focus should be on what is termed right-sizing or smart decline adapting the infrastructure and the services to a new norm of less people. New Zealand has its own challenges with uneven geographical development, which I'll illustrate later using GIS maps. And while shrinking cities are not a major feature in the country yet, regionally uneven development is. While Auckland's rapid economic and demographic growth naturally raises overall national economic returns, it is also apparent that Auckland's performance differs significantly from that of other centres. Equab and Stevenson have drawn attention to what they call New Zealand's two-speed economy, Auckland and the rest. Equab has referred to the growing part in regional prosperity in the country and how many regions are being left behind, which in his words, and I quote, 
is creating zombie towns. In parallel, the Salvation Army states that many of these towns are at risk of catastrophic failure. The government, by contrast, argues that its business growth strategy and its regional growth strategies will help to identify regional strengths on which to build a competitive economy in which all regions should prosper. <clears throat> now, in the third section, I would like to focus on some of the research which I've undertaken. I've always been fascinated with geographical landscapes and the economic and social processes which play out across them, such as the changing industrial fortunes of cities like Detroit. Why are some places and regions able to reinvent themselves, such as Arrowtown, which started its life as a mining center, while others, such as Rewanui on the west coast, lag or even disappear? It is the struggling areas which have drawn me to work in what some might view as marginal spaces, where rising poverty, job loss and decline, or at best, maintaining an equilibrium are the reality. Striving for solutions to these crises and identifying key catalytic drivers of change has been a long-standing interest. I will now focus on examples from countries which I've worked in. The focus will be on Zambia, South Africa and New Zealand. Zambia, a good example of the playing out of political and economic forces on a region over time, comes from the Zambian Copper Belt, where I was born and, and have undertaken research work over the last 15 years. Much of my recent work there has been with Tony Bins and Sarah Major from the Geography Department and several of our Otago postgraduate students. In the Copper Belt region shown in the central map, Nationalization and the falling price of copper, shown in the graph on the right, led to economic collapse, shown in the pictures on the left, and mine closure, forcing tens of thousands of people into impoverishment in a situation where there is no state support or welfare. Um, many people were reduced to scavenging, and one of the worst um, realities is the picture at the bottom left, sorry, bottom center. This is Kabwe, a town just outside the Copper Belt, it is regarded as one of the 10 most toxic places on the planet, in the same league as Chernobyl. Lead and cadmium mining were the chief industries. Though the mines have since collapsed, but to survive, hundreds of people scavenge in the lead dumps um, with incredible health risks posed to themselves as a very basic form of survival. Fairly similar scenes play themselves out in contaminate, contaminated dumps of mineral material throughout the area. More recently, there has been reinvestment in the area by a new round of capitalism, which is reflecting the changing global economic order, this time primarily by Chinese and to a lesser degree Western capital. This scene has seen the selective reopening of mines, the establishment of new finery, refineries, and a vast new special economic zone only for Chinese factories, and the gifting and return of showpiece facilities to Zambia, such as the Ndola Sports Stadium. The reality, however, is that local employment in these new capital-intensive mines and industries is either for sometimes for Chinese workers, but it is often a fraction of what it was, leaving impoverishment to remain for the majority. After the mine closures started in the 1980s, the unemployment rates rose to 45% and poverty rates to 75%. According to Masasa, people of all social classes in some of the worst affected towns were forced to forage in the bush and to start growing their own food within the urban areas just to survive. Our research in this area has focused on the degree to which households have forced, been forced to become self-sufficient economically with a particular focus on food security. We established that up to 94% of households engage in urban farming in some of the towns far exceeding practicing rates in other Southern African cities, which seldom rise above 30%. In order to promote and support the strategy, we worked with one of the local councils and an NGO. Moving on to South Africa. My work in South Africa has focused on how local governments and communities, drawing on their own assets and resources, have attempted to respond to marginalization. This slide shows the reality of conditions in the poorer parts of the country, which are generally overpopulated and severely eroded, and to which people were forcibly removed under apartheid. These areas are littered with failed industrial and agricultural interventions, as shown on two of the pictures there. A key challenge for me has been trying to identify viable local responses to such developmental challenges. 
My initial work focused on how, in the early 1990s, communities, both black and white, in towns such as Stutterheim, sought to overcome historic inequalities and promote joint social and economic development, building of schools, market facilities, housing, and provision of limited employment did help to partially address apartheid-inherited inequalities. Other work with colleagues from South Africa and Tony Binns looked at issues such as community-based farming by impoverished communities in the Cat River Valley, shown on the left, to support livelihoods there, or small-town renewal and the provision of market facilities in the village of Seymour by local leaders. One of the more interesting projects has been looking not so much at how mining towns, but how mining regions restructure after mine closure. When gold was first discovered in the 1940s in what is known as the Free State Gold Fields, it was the richest gold seam ever discovered in the world and caused a rush on the London Stock Exchange. An area of farmland was transformed into a series of very large planned urban centers reaching a population of over 500,000 people by the 1990s, with up to 80,000 people directly involved in mining, and a dozen mines with possibly some 40 shafts in operation, with operations taking place two miles underground. However, over time, resource depletion and falling international prices led to the collapse of the industry and mass unemployment. The area has struggled to survive, but the city of Velkom, shown um, bottom center is finding a new role as a regional service and retail center, not for its city, but for the surrounding region as part of a restructuring initiative. And interestingly enough, in an attempt to diversify the economy, the government built a Formula One motor racing circuit shown on the bottom right hand side there. And it did hold several international Grand Prix, but however, it's now not as attractive as it used to be. Um, the sadder part of the picture is the bottom picture on the left-hand side. This is known as Zama Zama mining. And what takes place there is unemployed miners enter abandoned mine shafts. All the shafts have been sealed with thick concrete slabs, but they tunnel in around the side of the concrete and then lower themselves two to three kilometers underground on ropes and cables and using candlelight extract remaining gold ore which is brought to the surface and then disseminated through various illegal channels. So, um, so that's one of the more unfortunate forms of human survival. In smaller urban centers, there's been some significant local government interventions, such as in the town of Utrecht, where efforts were made to turn the town away from its historic dependence on coal mining into a game park by allowing wild animals to free range around the town, admittedly non-carnivorous ones and to support community farming. In Crichton, promotion of rail tourism and mission tourism and employment creation through establishing a dairy factory has started to turn economic fortunes around. And in fact, the council turned their, their council building into the railway station, so it has a dual purpose. There's also a role for alternate market mechanisms such as fair trade sales of rooibos tea from isolated rural communities which is a method of addressing the challenges of dealing in a market dominated by large corporates. Unfortunately, with the passage of time, some of these schemes have collapsed, while others continue and attempts have been made to revive stalled projects. At another level, a further research theme is that of the developmental state, which South Africa has made some impressive socio-economic invention, interventions in terms of. While there have been challenges and many failures, there have also been successes such as the building of nearly three million state houses since 1994, which certainly makes an interesting contrast with the New Zealand state housing record. The provision of approximately 500,000 public works jobs annually. For example, in the Working for Water program, which we're currently looking at, which employs 40,000 people annually, clearing alien vegetation, which is blocking water courses. In addition, there has been water, electricity, and sanitation provision to almost all of the population, and significant improvements in access to healthcare and social welfare. This takes me on to my third main regional interest, namely New Zealand. This has been a relatively recent focus of mine, which looks at regional differences, what is happening in small towns, and how communities and local governments are responding to the developmental challenges which they face. 
The first step has been trying to develop a profile of regional differences and to detail historic change. While I've had an interest in demographic change for some time as a lens to illustrate regional difference and change, it has been through working with Chris Garden and Geography, which has facilitated data analysis and spatial representation of national trends. At a regional and sub-regional level in New Zealand, there is selective population loss and gain. And whilst a change in population does not necessarily imply a change in the economy, it can be a surrogate indicator of job loss or gaps to be filled and changed market opportunities. Our work in New Zealand has led to us analysing census data and using GIS. Census data over time in the left-hand graph shows the inevitable reality of the New Zealand population urbanising at a rapid rate since 1910, when the urban population exceeded the rural for the first time, as shown in this graph. In the left-hand graph, and I apologise that the lines aren't all complete there, um, the rapid growth of the large urban centres, shown in orange, parallels the growth of the national population. But there's clearly a pulling apart from the population growth in the smaller centres and the rural areas. The 2013 census detailed the significant growth of Auckland and the larger centres, which we all know about. And at the macro level, the positive story continues, with only one of the country's 13 regions declining demographically. However, at the meso level, a very different story emerges, and 20 of the 67 territorial authorities experienced some degree of population loss between 2006 and 2013. If one examines the historical census record, some striking realities emerge, as shown in this slide. At the number of small towns with less than 300 people fell significantly from 1911 to 1981, while some might have, might have grown larger and others, others might have fallen, have become smaller and fallen out of the census count. Several, such as Tahakopa, shown in the two slides on the left-hand slide, side in the Catlins, a former vibrant forestry town with its own railway line, have now all but disappeared. Kelso, shown in the middle, and Waipori on the right, both in central, central Otago, have both disappeared over time, in both cases as a result of dams and flooding. Population and business records indicate town growth and decline. If one examines the experience of towns in the southern half of the South Island, distinctively different patterns emerge. Data for the Otago, Southland and Canterbury regions indicates the high population growths experienced in most regional towns between 1936 and 1981, with many towns growing up to 90%. And interestingly enough, you can see in the first column, tourism towns grew by 536% in that period. That all changes from 1981, where static position and often decline becomes the norm. And it is particularly timber, mining, the single sector towns which decline. Uh, but the growing towns, places like Wanaka, experience growth, as do commuting towns such as Lincoln in the commuting belt of um, Christchurch. If we move on to look at selective business growth, what we see there is this is an amalgamation of data categories of business change over time. And quite clearly the pulling apart between the single sector mining and timber towns and the commuter and, and tourism towns shows the entrenchment of uneven geographical development which is taking place. What we have also done is to map population change according to urban areas and district councils over time to provide an informed context for further research into uneven uh, development. In the first map, the circles on the left-hand side are scaled according to the size of each urban centre, with a reddish tone indicating population growth, while a blue tone indicates decline. The map shows the changes in the period 1981 to 2013. The reality of shrinking towns in many parts of the country, but also by contrast, the rapid growth of centres in the Queenstown and Bay of Plenty areas, for example, is instructive. The second map on the right shows urban change overlain on rural change depicted at the district level. In this case, the reversal of long-term rural decline, probably as a result of the dairy boom, in the South Island, indicated in red, is evident. But also clear is the much deeper-rooted structural loss experience across a large part of the North Island, shown in blue. One of the more interesting features of working with demographic data 
is it allows us to project forward as to how the population might change. This map on the left shows the predicted population change from 2013 to 2043. While some districts, such as the Central North Island, could lose up to 25% of their current population, others, such as the Christchurch hinterland, could grow by 50%. In both scenarios, significant infrastructural and services challenges are posed. Not shown here, but what we're also working out with is age differentials across the country. And if one was to map population decline of under 15 and under 25 year olds across the next 30 or 40 years, most of the regions outside the cities would go blue on these maps, whereas the population cohort of plus 65 goes red in almost all districts because of the population growth taking place there. In terms of the scale of where the growth will take place, the graph on the right-hand side from the Salvation Army shows it will be clearly skewed in favor of Auckland, where it is predicted 62% of all future growth in the next 30 years will take place. And as we can see from that graph, some 33% will take place in the other major centers and only a modest 5%, sorry, I beg your pardon, 27% in main centres and 11% from the provinces. In terms of the way forward for New Zealand towns, cities and regions, a series of potentially conflicting scenarios exist. At one level is the need to manage and respond to the rapid growth of Auckland and, the key cha and, and, and other key centres such as Tauranga and Queenstown. At another level is the question of how to manage situations where the population is close to static or even declining, and in most cases aging, whilst also having to contend with a, with a potential loss or at least restructuring of economic activity. In many areas, there will probably be fewer younger people, which will impact on the ability to fill employment gaps. Overlaying all of this is the reality of the prevailing institutional institutional and political framework, and the relatively narrow financial capacity of the local state relative to many other countries, including in the OECD, uh, to respond to situations like this. Institutionally, the government, through MBIE, MSD, and the Department of Internal Affairs, are working to encourage business and community activity in various regions. An examination of local authority documentation in areas where population growth is now near static reveals a continued growth fixation with numerous local authorities optimistically proclaiming that their district is an attractive place to live in and that it will draw in thousands of new residents. Other centers are, however, engaging in a more proactive fashion with the challenges they currently face. The Clutha District Council in their 2015 policy documentation, acknowledged that its population had declined and that further loss in ageing was not probably going to occur. As a result, they are seeking a living and working strategy in the context of these issues. It is, however, this interesting that the same district made global headlines last month with the marketing of the town of Kaitangita as a place to settle and work in. The BBC, The Guardian and The Telegraph all carried the story. Um, they sell the town as a place to live and work in because the district has more job opportunities than job seekers. To date, over 10,000 inquiries have been received. And while few will probably actually lead to relocation to the district, what has happened illustrates the reality that local agents and creative ideas can play a role in seeking to alter a region's fortunes. It, <clears throat> it is in consideration of local action that my discussion now turns. Work I've undertaken with Sean Connolly from Geography and, other, and through engagement with various small town community facilitators. Despite the degree to which market-led thinking dominates the country's political economy, significant local government, business and community activity is helping to make a positive difference to the life of small town New Zealand. While such interventions may not guarantee population or economic growth, they may restore a degree of economic vibrancy. These include efforts such as those by local entrepreneurs in Tira on the North Island, shown on the left, through a focus on corrugated ironwork with their famous corrugated iron sheep and sheepdog shown there, and other efforts to turn the town into an, anti an antique shopping destination.
Similarly, in Shannon, shown at the top, and Muraki below that, individual entrepreneurs have established a number of boutique shops and a restaurant and are helping to make these towns weekend destinations. In Lawrence, the community took over local healthcare facilities and has an active promotions committee which promotes local tourism and with local business support made the town the first free internet town in the country. In Blackwall, and sorry, if I could just say as an aside, they fed off the Dunedin grid to do that, yet still managed to do it for free, apparently. In Blackwall, Geraldine and Athol, local entrepreneurs were instrumental in encouraging community projects and business activities. At a community level in recent years, linked with the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs, efforts have gone into youth training and job placement schemes in places such as Otrahonga and Belclutha. In Kawara, shown on the left, a closing private business left a legacy project to the local community, which provides rental income to fund community development and training, while the, lo while the local government activity actively seeks new economic opportunities. In Oportiki, while the local government is seeking to develop a local aquaculture industry on the estuary in the town, a social entrepreneur is supporting marginalized people to enter the workforce in the kiwi fruit industry. In Hokitika and Kumara, community and business action and support from the local government has helped to restructure their economy away from dependence on resource extraction to one based on tourism and dairy processing. Local foci such as the Wild Food Festival, town promotion, historical signage, a cycle trail, and hotel redevelopment are the result of this collaboration. Moving on to my conclusion. So in conclusion, what I hope I've demonstrated this evening is that uneven geographical development is not only a reality which has shaped the world in which I have lived, but one which continues to shape and mold the lives of, of people, the economy, and society around the world. Social inequality, unfortunately, appears to be increasing, both within and between countries. And this in turn overlays and exacerbates uneven geographical development, which itself is conditioned by changes in the economy, lock-in effects in society, and path dependency. Within this context, as I've shown, people, local businesses, and communities do respond, either out of compulsion or choice. And in this response, their strategies can vary from survival ones, such as urban agriculture in Africa, to the work of individuals, often businesses with a sense of social obligation, all working through community groupings to assist the marginalized, as does happen across New Zealand, but is less evident in other countries such as South Africa. Possibly due to the dominance of the state um, in that country, this all relates to evolutionary economic geography, which argues that local places can change their area's growth trajectory and respond, to some measure, to uneven geographical development. Having researched in such different economic contexts, from one which, use, which has the attributes of a developmental state to one where the free market dominates, it is interesting to note the differences and also what works in the lagging regions. While the development state has resourced initiatives, some have failed or lapsed into an activity, while others have succeeded in providing houses and employment. In New Zealand, by comparison, state intervention in lagging regions is more limited, leaving towns to the volatility of market forces. Nevertheless, a few individuals have, of their own volition, made an impact on their small towns. I feel privileged to have been able to experience such diverse economic and socio-political systems, in particular to observe and celebrate the efforts being made by individuals and occasionally by the state, especially in lagging regions in different parts of the world, to address poverty and empower people, despite obvious adversity and risk. I envisage that my future research will continue to focus on questions of marginalization and responses to poverty in regions characterized by unequal development. In addition to working in the areas detailed in my presentation, Chris Garden and I have started preliminary work on map mapping differential growth in three different countries, once again using the red and blue color scheme for Australia, South Africa, and Canada. In this case, we're dealing with literally tens of thousands of data points, so statistically it's a rather overwhelming challenge. But nonetheless, it does assist with our future planning of research, and certainly this is work which I'm starting to follow up with in Canada and South Africa. 
communities in lagging regions with ambitious plans for growth will require external support, such as the redistribution of resources from the state to achieve their objectives. Other towns may wish to right-size or, or augment their towns by attracting and valuing those individuals who give their own passion to their small town, imparting a degree of vibrancy, even in places with declining populations. To conclude with the words of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, sustainable development is the pathway to the future we want for all. It offers a framework to generate economic growth, achieve social justice, exercise environmental stewardship, and strengthen governance. Thank you for your attention this evening, and my special thanks to Theresa, my wife, to Tony, and to Michelle for their help with the presentation this evening. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, my name is Tony Ballantyne and I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor of the Humanities here at the University and it's with great pleasure I will deliver a vote of thanks to Ijean for this tremendous lecture. He has really delivered an excellent lecture, providing rich insights into the development of his research and taking us on a journey or perhaps a series of journeys with him through the development of his thought and his writing and he has offered an engaging, and I'd also say a very humble, set of reflections on the significance of his work. The relationships between space and social difference have stood at the heart of his talk, especially the analytical concept of uneven geographical development. He has not only demonstrated the analytical power of that concept to illuminate the worlds around us, from here in New Zealand to Southern Africa, but he has also anchored his personal reflections in that notion. I think he's offered a really compelling recounting of his formative years and what now are Zambia and Zimbabwe and then subsequently in South Africa. I think most importantly, Etienne's lecture has underlined the tremendous power of the social sciences to illuminate and explain the world that we live in. He has reminded us of the importance of place, the very real power of social and cultural difference and the significance of the state in shaping our social formations and in articulating what we value. The kind of work that he does as a researcher and as an excellent teacher helps us better understand this world that we all live in. And he has pointed us to some important pathways to the future, particularly with his final quote. And I think we all look forward to seeing uh, how his future research trajectory develops as he tackles these most pressing set of intellectual, social and economic questions. Personally, I also think that Etienne's lecture has demonstrated many of the qualities that make him a truly excellent colleague. He is not only a top-class teacher, top-class researcher, but he is also deeply humane and he is a truly excellent institutional citizen. I know everyone here is simply delighted to be sharing this occasion with you, Etienne. So could you please join me in thanking Etienne again?